Okay, well, um, up to this point when we've been sharing, we were sharing with the, uh, with the young people who left this morning. And we had a different theme than the one that the Lord's given me for, for you guys. So we're going we're gonna to go off on that. Um, but it pertains to <clears throat> the, wis- the wisdom of God. And uh, from some of my studies, I've realized that a lot of times the problems that we have and the darknesses that we enter into and the bad situations, a lot of times are not just the devil or even the flesh. It's a lack of really understanding how God thinks and, and the wisdom that he has because <clears throat> his wisdom is not. You know, his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. So since that's the case, we need to, we need to have his thoughts and his ways. But anyway, um, Robert and I just were saying a few words before uh, uh, the class tonight, um, talking about Elijah, the prophet. And um, as, I, as I meditated upon it, and his whole thing, and I'll talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> but as I meditated upon it, I really realized that his whole problem was he just didn't understand the wisdom of God. He was, you know, he was in confusion. And we usually think when we're in confusion, that that's can't be God, you know, uh, that's us or whatever. <clears throat> well, it, it's not God trying to confuse us at all. Um, but as usual, it is the need for us in our hearts to begin to separate from our ways and our thoughts and the way that we think God should be. We should find His heart. We should look for His heart. And we should uh, uh, not look for it with an expectation of what we think we're going to find. Um, but rather... And we have the Holy Spirit. Uh, so, it, you know, asking the Holy Spirit to to open the Word, to open, but, you know, even opening the Word <clears throat> is great, but when He opens the Word, that should be opening His heart to us. We should begin to see Him and His, his ways, you know. Uh, and, you know, the Scriptures say His ways are past finding out, right? So we go, okay, well, then I won't try. (laughs) I won't try. But in truth, the Holy Spirit will show us. We won't find them out. They can be disclosed to us by the Holy Spirit. So I was just thinking about um, Elijah and his, um, just that little portion there in uh, 1 Kings 19. And so he goes up against the, you know, all of the prophets of Baal. You remember that? And, uh, you know, there's a big, the, the prophets of Baal are making this big display and nothing's happening. And, and so they're, they finally start screaming and cutting themselves and trying to do stuff to get their God to answer. <clears throat> and um, and uh, Elijah understood enough that he waited and let them go as long as they wanted to until it came to the time of the evening sacrifice. And then he offered. Because that's when God said, that's when you offer the evening sacrifice. So it wasn't a trick and it wasn't just a, well, I'm, I'm better and I know, you know, God's <laughs> going to move because of me. He knew that. <clears throat> But then God, you know, then the whole thing happens and uh, they are defeated. And um, so there's a great victory and I'm sure he felt really good about it all. And I'm sure that uh, he felt confident in the Lord, you know, and the presence of the Lord was with me and the hand of God was with me and all that. And so Jezebel gets upset with him, you know. (laughs) She's upset, and she says, well, you know, you're going to die, basically. 
I'm going to see to it that, that you're dead. And he just goes, you know, it's like a balloon. All the air goes out of it, you know. It has no strength and, you know, all this kind of stuff because all of a sudden the mood changed or something new was brought in. Um, and um, let's face it, we, we live a lot in this world. Instead of in Him, we live and move and have our being. We live a lot in this world. And when the mood changes, uh, and the situation changes, it can throw us off. That's one reason why we need to understand God and it's really understanding not just the wisdom of God, it, it certainly is that, but <clears throat> it is the way that he thinks. It is the way that he proceeds. It is the way that he sees. And to do that, there has to be a break with our strong minds and our strong ways of thinking that uh, not just the way that it should be, but the way that we perceive that God should be. Because if we don't, we're going to be confused again. We're going to be um, tripped up over that. And so, um, when Elijah, Elijah hears this, he runs for his life. You would think, you just defeat it. How many prophets were there? How many? 400? I don't know. But there were a lot. I mean, there was enough to go, okay, one little lady. <laughs> you know, I think that we should be able to handle this. <clears throat> but she was the queen and she was evil and everyone knew that there was evil behind that. And all this kind of stuff. So he runs. He goes for his life, it says. And he, he goes, he's heading down south. And he, he finds a juniper tree. And he sits down under the juniper tree and uh, bemoans his, you know, the situation that he's in. And, and he passes out, basically. And it takes an angel to come wake him up and have some food there for him, you know. Sometimes it takes an angel to come wake us up, put some food there, come on, you know, you can do this, good boy, you know. And, uh, uh, and he, he keeps doing that, you know, and, and, and telling him, you've got a journey. You've got a journey. You need to eat. You need to get filled up for this journey because you're going to need all the strength you got. You're going to need, this is the word, strength for the journey. And um, so, you know, uh, he, uh, you know, he's waking up, he's eating, but he goes through this thing of, you know, uh, I might die, you know, I should die. That's what he says. I should die. And one of the phrases he uses is that he says, uh, I am not better than my father's. I, Lord, just kill me. Well, whoever told you you were better than them? <laughs> Where'd that come from? You understand? He's already, he must have been thinking that, and now he's disappointed because he wanted a bigger victory, you know. I mean, uh, Joshua won the battle at Jericho. You know, Lord, let me keep winning these battles. And, um, but that's, that's what he, he goes to. That's the words that he goes to. I know better than my father's. Lord, just go ahead and put me to death. Um, so he falls asleep again. <laughs> he wakes him up, gives him some more food. And then <clears throat> finally sets him on, on his journey and and the angel had told him that it was a long journey. It was going to be 40 days, what was it, 40 days? Yeah, 40 days and 40 night journey. So he's, he's going out of Israel. He's going down south, yeah. You know, he's heading toward uh, Mount Horeb. Uh, and um, 
and that's where God is directing him to go. Um, and so he gets there and he goes into a cave. You know what a cave is, right? Yes. A cave is a dark place. However dark it was on the journey, he went into a darker place, into a cave, where there's nobody there to comfort you. There's no, just you in the darkness. How's that sound to you? <laughs> it doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound good. And yet, uh, one of the things I want us to see as we get into this, and, and I won't stay on this story, but I, one of the things I want to want to happen is um, that instead of me doing all the sharing, that for me to bring in areas and ask you what you think, um, and um, and it doesn't matter, you know, we're not looking for perfect answers. We're we're looking to um, see if the Lord has something for us. That that if that if one of you has something from the Lord for us in relationship to these things. And, uh, and I'm saying that now because, you know, there is a phrase in one of the things I want to share that speaks of darkness. And wouldn't it be good to understand the wisdom of God in darkness? You know, instead of being just in darkness and, um, and fear and all that goes along with that. So... Um, one of the things that, that um, Elijah kept saying was, you know, you know, I'm the only one left, and uh, I'm, you know, all the people have left you, and you know, now they're seeking my life, and he keeps saying this over and over. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> it's just like, uh, you know, it's almost as if he wants to stop everybody along the forty day and night journey and say, I'm just, you know, it sounds like a pity party. That's what we call them, pity party. <laughs> anyway, um, some of y'all know what that's like, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so he's in the cave, and God says, uh, go forth out of the cave, because he's been sitting in there in darkness. God, folks, I'm telling you, if you don't know the wisdom of God, and you don't know his heart and his wisdom, then you're going to be confused and you're going to have fear and you're going to not have answers. And um, so he's, he's been sitting in there for a while and God says, you know, uh, I want to show you something. And um, he says, you know, I'm going to meet you there. And the Lord passes by. And when the Lord passes by, there's a strong wind. And it's so strong that it is shaking the mountains and it's cracking the rocks. And then it says, but the Lord was not in the wind. You know this part, right? Mm -hmm. You know this. <laughs> and so, so while he's standing there then, let's see if I can remember what was next. Earthquake or fire? Which one? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, so there was an earthquake, and uh, that's shaking everything. And then there's fire, and, um, <clears throat> and finally, uh, God says to you know, that a still small voice. We've heard this. We all know these, a still small voice. And... Uh, Let's see, because I want to stay with this. Okay, so let me just read this. Uh, we're not going to really spend much time here. But it says, uh, uh, and after the earthquake of fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. So the Lord's not in any of these. And after, uh, and, uh, and after the fire, a still small voice. And, and it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him. 
So the Lord was in the still small voice. So he hears that and he goes in the cave and there com- here comes this still small voice. And the Lord is in this. And the voice said unto him, what are you doing here? <laughs> what are you doing here? Well, is he talking just physically? What are you doing here in this place that you're at when I'm over here? When my heart is here, when my view is here, where, where, where your comforts are over here, but you're over there. Wow. And that was the still small voice. It wasn't a great revelation. I mean, I think it was, <laughs> ultimately. But it was, it was, um, it wasn't a voice that said, you're separated from me. You're in darkness. Didn't say, it wasn't meaning that. That wasn't what the point was. You're far away. No. It was... What are you doing there when I'm right here? Just come over here. (laughs) Stop being over there. Just come over here. And, well, not just come over and be comforted, though. But let's come over where he's at. Do you understand the difference? It's not, it's where he is. Not just come over to comfort so he can go, dear, dear, they were mean to you. <laughs> not, he's, the Lord's not going to do it. He's not wanting to do that. You, you, I know some, our wisdom says, well, the first thing he wants to do is, is um, uh, comfort me. Well, he's a comforter. No question about it. And, and the, you know, of course, the Holy Spirit's considered a comforter, but it never really shows him as one going there, there. He's always revealing Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. Bible people? Yes. <laughs> he's revealing Christ, and he's comforting us with another reality with being able to see outside of our little box that we think is so wise and so together and so you know full of scriptures that are actually all jangled up but they're they're, you know we go well they're scriptures you know but he wants to put them in order and he wants to put our heart in order and he does that by bringing us into his heart and into his mind and 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 then when we when we begin to see as he sees then we see. Then we see. And everything else is it, it, quite possible. Probably a whole lot of other stuff is um, Christian doctrine, um, uh, pet scriptures that we've held on to. You know what I mean? The scripture's my pet. You know, I love you because you you make me feel comfortable or whatever. You know, the Lord is supposed to be all of those things. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord, you know what I mean? And um, so, uh, so you have an incredible man of God. We're talking about Elijah. Do you understand that what this must have done to him? Because later on in the New Testament, when Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses showed up and one other person. Elijah. Whoa! What a leap! He had to have come in to the wisdom of God because without it, we're in confusion because his mind, his ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts. They're just not. And, um, uh, and it's hard, you know, especially if we've been uh, Christians for years and years and years, 
um, we hear so much teaching. We hear so many things. Um, you know, for example, I mean, I can we can talk about you know the wisdom of God here, but I can't give you the wisdom of God. <laughs> only, only the Holy Spirit can do that. But by the word going forth, the Holy Spirit might, on the wings of that, say something to you. But I can't show, I can tell you, I can actually, in some cases, maybe if I had a chalkboard saying that it would go this way and this way and this way. But it still doesn't help until you not only see his wisdom, but see how he thinks. The order, if I could put it like this, if I had not a chalkboard, but a magnet board, and we had words, and we had a bunch of words on there, and so I put the words in order of the way that he would think. That's still not the way he thinks. That's, that's just, right. the, you know, and it's not until he puts that in us. Until he opens our eyes, until he has drawn us out of our dark cave, dark and scary cave, dark and damp and scary cave, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, you know, I heard something, you know, said a big tarantula, you know, coming to get me, whatever. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, without the wisdom of God, we're going to think this is all out of order and this should never have happened and I don't know what went wrong. I should have stayed in victory up there and somehow I lost it because of Jezebel. You didn't lose it because of Jezebel. Sure, she said, you know, of course she's going to say that. You know, you killed my prophets, I'm going to kill you. That's Jezebel. What do you expect from her? Give you muffins? <laughs> you know, no. No, she's going to be who she is. The devil's going to be who the devil is. People are going to be who they are. And you don't live there. I don't live there. We don't live there. We live in Him. And He lives in us. And we are growing up in Him, in all things, the Scripture, the Bible says. And so, uh, and none of this is meant as condemnation. It's not, it's not meant as condemnation. It's, it's meant that, that we can see from an example with Elijah, who was a mighty man of God, that you can know a lot, but it's really ultimately not about how much you know about God. It's how much He's formed in you, in His mind, in His ways, in His heart. And, and that, that comes by your heart. Not wanting to be a great Christian or, or be a powerful Christian, because you had all that, you know, the rocks are breaking the fire, you know, all of that, you're seeing all of that in your darkness, you know. <laughs> yeah, look at the power. He's going, a little still voice. I just want to say something to you. Speak, Lord, for your servant here. What are you doing here? <laughs> Would you come back to me? So, so I just wanted to read that. His, final, his statement that he kept making, and then we'll move on. Um, and he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, and thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. All right, good grief. I know darkness is tough, but come on. There's a, there is a place of rest in darkness. There is. And there's even 
and that's one of the things we want to just see how we can all join in and in sharing on there's even a place for darkness in his wisdom and most Christians would go, oh, a heretic, off with his head. Well, there he is. There he is. All right. So, um, so off of that story now, I want to just sort of set the stage for a few things. Um, I was reading in the New Testament in the Gospels. Um, in Matthew and I came across a phrase that I'd never noticed before and um, and it was uh, and some of you that are some of you that are in some of the classes or whatever that I teach I've introduced this already but for those of you that haven't, it was when Jesus started speaking in parables. And my view of, you know, it's a, it says stuff like this. Jesus spoke, in, spoke a parable, said this. And then, uh, you know, if you have a red letter Bible, it says Jesus spoke in parables like this in black and then it'll say what he said and then it'll say another parable in black and then red letter he says the new parable and then da 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 but when he got down to a certain place it says this and this is in Matthew thirteen thirty five he says just this is Jesus talking quoting uh, uh, the Old Testament, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Okay, so that really threw me because I, you know, again, here we go. I didn't see as I should have, but I, I always kind of thought the parables were nifty little sayings, nice little things that you could kind of dig around in and find a little jewel to preach on or something like that. You know, that it's a parable. And, you know, well, this man did this and da 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 and, you know, and it would be like a, a 30 minute blessing or something. I don't know. But it hit me the way this said it was, I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. And what we're talking about here is the wisdom of God. We're talking about the wisdom of God. And so that started me on a journey um, to begin to examine not just the parables. It actually started me on a journey to want to um, look at places in the scriptures that speak uh, that were there before or, or let's just say since the foundation of the world to go back to those places like Genesis and to really look and to really go, okay, I want to listen. I want to pay attention. I want to, this is something important to you. And I could tell it was. I mean, I mean, out of all of Jesus' teachings, I, and this is me, and I'm sorry, but this is, you know, I thought, well, the parables are kind of the lower class <laughs> teachings or something. You know, you know, I want to tell you a little parable. A little boy had two stones or something, you know. But he's saying that there is something so deep that it's at the foundation of the world. Oh, that just struck a chord in my heart to, to want to be with him, to know him, to hear his heart in relationship to these things. And, and a certain amount of shame that I had so lightly... Uh, you know, looked at those things. 
And, and Lord willing, when we get toward the end, we'll go over some of the parables. Um, okay, so in uh, Genesis, turn to Genesis chapter 2. Look at Genesis right now without trying to explain a lot. <clears throat> but I want to start us on a, a little bit of a journey on wisdom throughout the Bible. Because there's a progression of wisdom as it goes throughout the Bible. <clears throat> Genesis 2, verse 15 through 17, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Okay, so uh, if you consider the wisdom, the wisdom that God gave Adam and Eve, they were pretty simple instructions. Let me just think about it. Don't eat of this, or you'll die. Everything else, it's all yours. <laughs> all right. So, uh, uh, so then, you know, but but there's a there's a little bit of a ominous thing there. I mean, it, Adam and Eve are, are created. They're the first of mankind. This is the first encounter with their maker. And he says, you know, you can, you can eat anything you want here. Anything you want. Just don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because you shall surely die. So, I mean, and so we're talking <laughs> a wide spectrum here. And then we're, you know, the garden and all that's in there. And then we're talking about just one little area. And, uh, and what that one little area is, there's, there's something dangerous in relationship to it. Okay, so now I want to talk about Satan's wisdom a little bit. Um, I, I wrote this little thought when, when I got to thinking about, let's go to Satan's wisdom. I, I wrote, to me, talking about Adam and Eve, to me, they seem not very well armed to stand against an attack of Satan. Don't eat of that. <laughs> you know, oh yeah, that's a, you know, it just doesn't seem like that's, that's enough. For them to withstand, you know, uh, Satan in this situation. So, Genesis chapter 3, starting with verse 1. <clears throat> now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know God doth know that in the day that you eat, so God doth know, in other words, he's implying that God is holding you back so that he can have it all. He can be God and you, but God doth know that if you eat it thereof, then your eyes shall, shall be open and you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. So God is trying to stay the top man and keep you down. Which, if you know anything about 
Isaiah 14 or Ezekiel 28, you know that's exactly, that's those scriptures show that spirit where he fell, what brought about his fall. <clears throat> and verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Okay, so... Um, Uh, there is there is a wisdom which uh, let's see yeah I think I'll get into is somebody keeping tabs on the time though I don't want to go super long okay at least warn me at about 45 minutes <clears throat> um, so there is there is a wisdom that God has but we're not seeing it at the stage where we come in um, with Adam and Eve. And a lot of times we think that's, that's where it all began. And it's not. Um, so we'll, we'll eventually get to that. And then there's a wisdom that Satan had that he didn't have always because he was Lucifer. And he was not, he was not a fallen angel during the portion. But then he came up with a, his own wisdom. And that wisdom is very different from God's wisdom. <clears throat> so, um, I'm, uh, I'm pulled between two things here, whether to go into this next phrase or to just point out some interesting things to make you think. Because I really, here's the deal. I don't want you just to listen. I want you to be thinking about these things when we're not together. Please, uh, take a little bit of time to do that because I believe that the Holy Spirit is here to, you know, open our hearts more to Him. So, <clears throat> so I think I'm going to jump down to a contrast. This almost takes me a few minutes just to get there. Um... I'm trying to make sure. Okay. I want to show you two big, two different pictures. Two different <laughs> pictures in relationship to what we would call uh, the creation of Adam. And I want you to think about them because they are different. And they're both in Genesis in the first couple of chapters but they're not the same. And it feels like there's something different that has happened that we need to be become aware of. <clears throat> so let's, so I'll, I'll do a little bit of reading first, so y'all just pay attention. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. <clears throat> and God said, let us make man. Okay, so this one is the first, this was the first one. This is the first chapter, Genesis 1, 26. <clears throat> and this is the um, <laughs> this is the victory version. All right. <clears throat> and God said, "Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creature, a creeping creature that creepeth upon the earth." Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowls of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of, the tr of a tree yielding seed, 
To you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Okay. Now I want to read out of Genesis chapter 2. This is uh, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. I want you to notice the words created and made. <clears throat> These are the generations of the heavens. The generations, plural, of the heavens. Um, <clears throat> and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Verse 5 and every plant of the uh, of the field before it was in the earth. Okay, let's read that again. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth. Mm. Anybody seeing something there? What is this before it was in the earth? Okay, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. Okay, I want you to notice the words, there was not a man to till the ground. Now this is, this is not the victory chapter. That was chapter 1. This is chapter 2. There was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Okay. Back in chapter 1, it says, so God created man in his own image. Um, It's a different word that God created over here. But here he's forming man. And it would make sense that if you create something, you could form it to something, but it's still two different things. Okay. Um, uh, and notice that um, that's, I'm making sure here. Yeah, the last part of verse 5 was, there was not a man to till the ground. Verse 6 has, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Okay. So now I'm just going to read, uh, and I don't want to give you too much yet, but I, but um, what the Lord may do with some of this is not necessarily going to happen right at the moment I'm sharing it. It's not necessarily going to happen during this time we're together. But may the Lord begin to, number one, make us notice things in the world, just the differences that we didn't see, and there's still much more. Um, and then ask, Lord, I have no clue what that means. Why would, why would you, you know, um, uh, and he created every plant of the field before it was in the earth. You know, I mean, just to ask questions, and but but don't say, "Oh God, I don't understand." Say, "Father, I want to know your heart. I want to know your wisdom. I want to." There's this isn't random stuff. It, behind it is the knowledge of the Lord. Behind it is the a relationship that can be so much more if we understand Him. Um, okay, so um, um, okay, so I didn't even finish verse uh, 
5, so I'll say it again. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb in the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. And here it is. And there was not a man to till the ground. Do I have 45 minutes left? Is that what that's saying? <laughs> what does that say? It's at 45 minutes. 45 minutes is up. Yeah. We just started. <laughs> uh, just no, I do want you to know. But usually you put uh, the other direction. five minutes, yeah. Four minutes, three yeah. minutes. Okay. <clears throat> I'm happy. I'm fine. I'll just keep going. That's, that's, that's how you overcome that. Like <laughs> okay, but see, especially right here. Not right here. Don't raise it. On this one verse, for the Lord God had caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. Remember, he had said that earlier, still in chapter 2, about a man to till the ground when there was no, before he even said something about forming man. Um, and... Uh, well, it's after that. It's right after that. The very next verse in verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Um, so I'm not going to read verse 8 to you, but basically it says this, that he, um, he the very next verse, God planted a garden and put the man in it to till the garden. So I do want to read this and then we'll, we'll take a break or stop. In Genesis 1.27, God created man on the sixth day. But here in Genesis 2.7, after God had rested on the seventh day. Yeah, this is after God has rested. Verse 7 and 8 that we're on. But here in Genesis uh Two seven. After God had rested on the seventh day, He now forms man. Also in Genesis um, uh, twenty six through thirty, God is bestowing. It must be one twenty six through thirty. God is bestowing the whole creation made over to man's dominion. In the in the in the victory version, chapter one. He created man. You're in my image. I give you dominion over everything, over all this stuff. And now he's moving him into just being a gardener. One chapter later. <coughs> all right. So, um, uh, bestowing the whole creation made over to man's dominion, as if he is Lord of the manor, but in chapter 2, 5, in passing, he mentions that there was no man to till the ground. Then mentions that he forms, forms man, not creates the man. What does he form Adam for? Verse 8 says that he now plants the garden that he longed to have a gardener to tend it, which he'd mentioned all the way back in verse 5 first. Then he puts the man in it. Finally, in Genesis 2.15, it says, And the Lord God took the man, put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Does this sound like a ruler over all animals and all beasts and everything else? See, I, I'm just telling you, I, you know, this, this isn't a little, you know, puzzle. Uh... There's so much that we don't know of the Lord. There's so much we don't know of the Bible. And, and uh, you know, I know that some people say, well, we'll have all eternity to know the Lord and everything. But I want to know Him now. I mean, I want Him formed in me now. I care about Him now. I care about Him now. You know, and it's like... Well, okay, you know, the Lord's up there going, okay, I give you a free pass. The whole time you're on your on the earth, don't worry about me. Just be happy and have me run after you. No, that's not his heart. He wants us as one with him. And um, and this is this is the 
this is the time, actually. I don't know how to say it to you, but this is the time, not in the future, you know, not in eternity. And um, so, um, so that's one of the things that I want to do is I want to um, get into some of the scriptures. We'll, we'll try to finish this off, but I want to get into more than this. I, I, I wanted to use this as a kind of a diving board into some other things, but that our hearts would be more set on Him. So, is it okay if I pray? Father, You showed us um, with Elijah, a great man of God, who was being used greatly and yet, with the, just the flip of a switch, he was running for his life, forgot everything of you, your strength, your mind, your might, and was in despair even unto death. And Father, you, you came to him in a dark place. You came to him in a dark place. And you showed wisdom. You showed incredible wisdom that, uh, Father, many of the prophets never saw. And that's why he was up there with Moses and Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. He got it. He got it. He saw your heart. He saw what you really wanted. And it strengthened him. And it strengthened him for others. And it strengthened him to not just die, but to go to you, to go to you, and to throw his mantle down and let it fall on another as he enters into being with you. So, Father, all these things can be as mysteries to us, but if you so choose, you can open our eyes, and, but mainly our hearts. And just to say, Father, I want you. I want you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, I want you. And I want you the way you want to be with me instead of me formulating a way for you to jump through my hoops to be with me. And so we trust you and we look to you and we thank you that that it is in your heart that we grow up in you, Jesus, in all things. So bless our meetings, and bless our free time, and may it be a joy to your heart that we all came together from different places. We all sought you, and may it indeed bring joy to your heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now forget everything I taught. <laughs> just ask it's the just Lord. A huh? It's just a puzzle. It's just a puzzle, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just seek the Lord. Your socks, Jennifer. <laughs> Sunshine. I like that. Paul says it's hidden wisdom, hidden from the foundation of the earth. Yeah, we'll hit on that one, but that's that's a good start right there. Sure is. Yeah, so that's what we're gonna excited about. We're gonna. Yeah, the seeds are hidden before the foundation. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, before the foundation of the world. Yeah, yeah. So we will... We have to tell. Mm. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's exactly one of the examples used in the parables mm. that talk about things before the... We have to dig. <laughs> mm. Stir us up. Yeah. And there are a lot of scriptures in the New Testament uh, 
that use that phraseology, lamb slain before the foundation of the world, did right. give away right there. <laughs> but there's others, there's many others. And uh, I mean, it's kind of exciting because if he wants us to know him the way he was before the foundation of the world, then much of the way we know him has been based on this earth. Amen. You know, when this is all gone and rolled up like a scroll, then what? I mean, this shouldn't scare us. It's not scary. It's not, it shouldn't make us afraid. It shouldn't make us hungry. Hungry for his heart.